This is Faith Ignited, the podcast where we put God back into history. Episode 9, The Flame of Truth. The woods were still and deceptively calm when a sudden explosion of gunfire sent bullets pelting through the air. Before the English soldiers had time to react, nearly the entire front line of men had been struck down by the volley of muskets, their lifeless corpses collapsing to the earth. Frightening, high-pitched yelping mixed with the sounds of gunfire as half-naked warriors, alongside Frenchmen, emerged from their hiding places, hundreds of them swarming through the brush. George's heart took off at a gallop and his horse reared back in fright. Forward, he heard General Braddock cry out. The general raced to the front to lead the confused and startled troops. George urged his horse to follow. He saw the general's other aides also racing to the front to help rally the men. Their attempts to do so were fruitless. So great was the disarray and fear that the English troops were quickly being swept down before their opposition, many shooting haphazard shots into the brush, sometimes hitting their own comrades rather than the enemy. George heard a cry of pain as one of his fellow aides was struck, toppling headlong off his horse. The leaders were much easier to pick off than the soldiers on the ground. Standing at six foot two, George knew he was a large enough target as it was. He felt the bullets whizzing past him, one blowing off his hat, another striking his horse. As it collapsed, George came to his feet, breathing heavily. He was only just recovering from a lengthy sickness, and he could tell he had not quite regained his full stamina yet. Gathering his strength, he mounted another horse, rejoining the battle from his high position. The general, too, had fallen wounded, and George focused his attention on conveying his superior's orders to the men. But it was no use. These soldiers were accustomed to open field combat. They'd never seen war such as this. Many began throwing down their weapons and fleeing for their lives. George was ashamed of their cowardice. Choosing to flee left the remaining men with no chance of survival, unless they also chose to leave. Yet another horse was shot out from under George. The remaining soldiers finally broke apart, throwing down their weapons and fleeing like sheep being pursued by dogs. A quick survey of the group told George that he'd been the only aide of the generals to survive. The thought was sad and even a little unsettling. When they were out of enemy range, George glanced down at his coat, his fingers tracing the fabric and looping through several round holes. The fabric was riddled with them. Somehow the bullets flying all around him had made numerous holes in his coat without penetrating his skin. Impossible, he thought. Not impossible, he corrected in his mind. Miraculous. For some reason, Providence had seen fit to spare his life. The question was, for what purpose had he been spared? I once heard history defined as what we choose to remember. Considering how little actually makes it into our history books, in comparison with the millions of lives and events that have transpired on this earth, I think that's pretty accurate. But there's a danger in that. Because what if we choose to remember the wrong things? And who determines what is worthwhile and what is not? Who decides what's preserved and taught to the rising generations? And what does that say about us and our society? An important thing for me to note is that History is unalterable. It cannot be changed. But it can be forgotten, or worse, sometimes misrepresented, which is just as dangerous. For the first hundred years or so of American history and education, it included the faith elements of history. It was taught in school. Not because we were trying to ram faith down people's throats, but the truth is, if you're going to present a factual representation of how this nation got started, it's almost impossible to take Christianity out of it. At least, you'd think it's impossible. The attempts to remove it have resulted in a shocking lack of historical understanding and perspective. Just to give you an example of this, we have 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Most Americans can name four or maybe five, probably George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, maybe James Madison. But what about Benjamin Rush or Samuel Adams? Who remembers Roger Sherman or Richard Stockton? 
Of the 56 signers, five were captured and tortured as traitors. Nine of them fought in the Revolutionary War, eventually dying from either deprivation or wounds. Two of them lost sons, and two others had sons captured. At least a dozen had their homes pillaged and then set on fire. Every single one of them was risking everything, knowing that to lose the war meant that they would be tried and executed as traitors. As far as the religious dynamic, we see that 95% or more were very strong and vocal Christians. The only ones whose faith we can even call into question are generally the names that we recognize. Coincidence? Probably not. But even the ones considered less religious, like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, they would still probably make Christians today seem pretty lukewarm by comparison. Over half of the declaration signers had evangelical or Bible degrees. A study was actually conducted a little while back where they were trying to discover what the inspiration was for the founders' creation of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And so after lots and lots of study and research, they came to the conclusion, the surprising conclusion, that it was overwhelmingly the Bible. No comparison. They by far quoted and drew inspiration from the Bible. So why don't we know these things? Because they aren't things that we've chosen to remember. They've not found their place in our history books because our society doesn't value them. But that in no way takes away their inherent worth. This is a part of our history, and this is who we are. But when we look at figures like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, those names that we're more familiar with, they may not fall into the category of the forgotten, but they definitely represent the slandered and the misrepresented. So one by one, I'll be covering the lives and the beliefs of both the men that we know and the names that you probably don't know in future episodes. I'll of course be covering other subjects along the way as well, but I'm hoping that eventually I'll be able to include each of them in their own episode. Now, it only seems right that I start with the father of America, perhaps if not undoubtedly the most influential figure in bringing about its establishment. George Washington, too, has fallen prey to slander and accusations. So let's address some of these issues, and I think you'll be amazed by how much you did not know about him. As with anyone's story, George Washington's didn't begin with him. He came from a pretty remarkable heritage. The blood in his veins traced back to Odin, the great Viking king of Scandinavia, a man whose, quote, life and character were so great and glorious that his people defied himself and his family and thus established a Scandinavian mythology of equal magnitude and grandeur to that of ancient Greece and Egypt. By his superior military talents, Odin had endeared himself to his subjects. He was successful in every combat, once his warriors believed that victory hung on his arm. When he sent forth his soldiers to any expedition, he laid hands upon them and blessed them. Then they believed themselves invincible. As the generations passed, the Washington family moved to England, then in 1650 settled in the British colony of Virginia. George's father lost his first wife after the birth of their fourth child. They only had two children who actually survived to adulthood, but then he married again, and George was the first child born to that union. Relatively little is known about George Washington's childhood. He was raised in the Virginian countryside where he learned to love the outdoors and how to work hard. If you've been following this podcast, you're probably familiar with the fact that tragedy is a pretty common theme in the lives of most great men and women, and George Washington is no exception to that. His father got gravely ill and died when he was only 11 years old. That's the kind of trial that causes somebody to grow up really fast. And George Washington was known to be pretty sober-minded and have kind of a serious demeanor. George's education level isn't fully known. We know that he didn't receive the advantages of high education like his two older half-brothers. And he felt, as he put it, a consciousness of a defective education. Despite this, George was a great reader, and he kept a large collection of books. One of the most interesting in his collection was a book called 
the rules of civility and decent behavior. Many of the things listed in this were practical in nature, such as how to be polite in society, but a few of them stand out to me, and in a way, they sum up the man George Washington came to be. So, just to list a couple of those points. It says, Let all your conversation be without malice or envy, and in all causes of passion admit reason to govern. When you speak of God and his attributes, let it be seriously and with reverence. Let your recreations be manful and not sinful. And this one especially, I think, is pretty remarkable. Labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. George really was always very mature for his age. When he was 14, an exciting opportunity presented itself. His brother Lawrence wrote, informing George and his mother that there was a position that had just opened up for a midshipman in the Royal Navy and that Colonial William Fairfax was willing to help secure the position for George. Now, George's mother was not very excited about the idea. Despite George's enthusiasm, no doubt she understood the dangers of going to sea. At one point, George even had his bag packed for departure, but in the end, George's mother won out, and George remained home. Very few people realize that this one decision made by Mary Ball Washington changed the course of history. Had George become a sailor in the service of the Royal Navy, it's not that likely that he would have gone on to become the father of America. So after having his dreams of sailing dashed, George took up surveying like his father. Through this, he learned the lay of the land, a skill that would serve him really well as a military man. George's brother Lawrence was actually an adjutant in the Virginia militia, but after a terrible struggle with his health, Lawrence finally succumbed, and he died when he was only 34. George's grief again was intense at the loss of his brother, whom he greatly loved and respected. However, when Lawrence died, his position as an adjutant was split between four different men. One of them was George. He was only 20 years old, not quite 21, when he was commissioned to the rank of major, and when people insisted that he was too young for such a big responsibility, one of the Fairfaxes responded, All Washingtons are born old. So this is how George ended up in the British military during the French and Indian War. At one point, while George was serving as a military aide to General Braddock, they were ambushed by a group of French and Indian soldiers. Every single one of the general's aides died, except for Washington. He had his hat shot off, and two horses shot out from under him. But he came away unharmed, with only bullet holes in his coat. And he attributed his survival to the protection of Providence. But there's more to that story that George did not learn about until 15 years later. Smoke ascended from the flames of the fire, curling upward and disappearing as the men took their places around it. George shifted in his seat, glancing over at his friend, Dr. James Crick, who looked just as confused by this meeting as George was. The Indian trader they'd come across had explained that he'd been conducting the party of a great chief named Red Hawk. This Red Hawk, he claimed, was the very chief who had commanded the Indians during the ambush on General Braddock's army. But George still couldn't imagine why this chief would want an audience with him. The trader hadn't told him what the chief wanted, insisting that Red Hawk would explain in person. So here they sat around a council fire, a combination of the Native American warriors and men who had accompanied George to Ohio. The old Indian chief struggled to his feet, the shadows of the fire enhancing the deep lines of his face. His eyes were penetrating and his voice commanding as he began to speak. The tongue he spoke in was foreign, but the interpreter translated in words George could understand. I am the chief and ruler over my tribes, repeated the translator in English. My influence extends to the waters of the Great Lakes and to the far Blue Mountains. I have traveled a long and weary path that I might see the young warrior of the great battle. George's eyes widened, realizing that the chief was referring to him. It was on the day when the white man's blood mixed with the streams of our forests that I first beheld this chief. I called to my young men and said, Mark yon, tall and daring warrior, 
He is not of the Redcoat tribe. He hath an Indian's wisdom, and his warriors fight as we do, himself alone exposed. Quick, let your aim be certain, and he dies. Our rifles were leveled, rifles which, but for you, knew not how to miss. Twas all in vain. The chief's voice quivered. A power mightier far than we shielded you. One warrior declared, I had seventeen fair fires at him with my rifle, and after all could not bring him to the ground. Seeing you were under the special guardianship of the Great Spirit, we immediately ceased to fire at you. Chills spread from George's head to his feet. But the chief wasn't finished. I am old, he continued, and soon shall be gathered to the great council of fire of my fathers in the land of shades. But ere I go, there is something bids me speak in the voice of prophecy. Listen. The great spirit protects that man and guides his destinies. He will become the chief of nations, and a people yet unborn will hail him as the founder of a mighty empire. I am come to pay homage to the man who is the particular favorite of heaven, and who can never die in battle." The murmurs of the men echoed around the fire. When George turned to look at James, he saw the wonder and surprise in his expression. Then he turned back to look at the chief, whose steady gaze held his. He'd known that God had protected him, but only now did he know to what degree. Dr. James Craig, who witnessed this event himself, told it to several Revolutionary War soldiers during times when they saw their commander exposing himself dangerously during battle. More than once, he caused his aides a lot of anxiety as he mounted a hill to spy out the opposition with bullets flying all around him. But as the Indian chief said, he was protected by a higher power. However, George had been retired from military life for some time when the seeds of rebellion began growing in America. He was busy on his farm when revolution was fast approaching. There's an important note I want to make here. One of the largest allegations that's laid against George Washington is that he was a slaveholder. And that's understandable because slavery is horrific. But before we condemn him, we should look at some of the context that's often left out. Remember that Washington lived in Virginia. The laws of Virginia would not allow him to emancipate his slaves. He did when he died, but even if slaves were freed, the chances were pretty high that they'd end up right back in slavery. Most of the slaves he had were given to him when he was a teenager, and he treated them like family. In fact, he underwent great financial stress to take care of them. Now, how is that the case? Let me explain. You see, as the years passed, and his slaves continued to have children and families, at that time, a person that was born to a slave was a slave. It's horrible, but that's how it was. And so, as Washington's slaves grew, he had way more hands than he needed to take care of the farm. Most owners of slaves at that time would have sold some off. You could make a lot of money from selling slaves. One field hand was worth as much as a city lot, and selling them would have instantly solved his financial stresses, but he refused to. Why? Because he was not going to separate families or, as he said, participate in the traffic of human species, even if it solved his financial problems. Washington signed the first federal anti-slavery law. He said, There is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for the abolition of slavery. He was trying to fight against laws that were already in place. The Continental Congress actually came within one vote of abolishing slavery throughout the colonies. But in the end, a civil war would be required to abolish it. But Washington himself was very adamant against slavery. He actually went out to actively recruit African-American soldiers to fight in the Revolutionary War. And nearly a fourth of the soldiers that fought in the Revolutionary War were African-American. So that's a fact that most people don't know. There was actually an African-American minister named Lemuel Haynes, and he was one of those. He fought side by side with George Washington. And when he went back to his church, he preached a special sermon about his general, George Washington. Now, going back to the tensions that were rising in America before the revolution started, America needed someone to look to, someone to lead their armies. The question in everyone's minds was, who do we turn to for deliverance? And far from vying for the position, Washington tried to talk them out of it. He felt, as he put it, 
great distress from a consciousness that my abilities and military experience may not be equal to the extensive and important trust. However, as the Congress desires, I will enter upon the momentous duty and exert every power I possess in their service for the support of the glorious cause. They offered George a salary of $500 a month, which he refused, insisting that he would keep track of his expenses and take no more than that. He didn't want to be paid for what he was doing. That's one of the things I love about George Washington. He was such a reticent hero. I can't, and I'm not going to try, to include a detailed account of every battle fought in the Revolutionary War. There are many, many miracles that go along with that, but hopefully, like I always say, we can cover that in a future episode. In this episode, I just hope to highlight some of the events that I feel illustrate the character of George Washington. So we're going to skip ahead several years. Seven years, in fact. That's how long the Revolutionary War lasted. Against all odds, the colonists came off victorious. It was improbable, to say the very least. Impossible is probably a more accurate word, but of course, impossible is not in God's vocabulary. George Washington said, The hand of Providence has been so conspicuous in the Revolutionary War that he must be worse than an infidel, that lacks faith, and more wicked, that has not enough gratitude to acknowledge his obligations. But what most people don't realize is that winning the war was only half the battle. What do you do with a nation that's now free? France fought a revolutionary war around the same time and had very different results. So now they had to consider how to keep a nation from falling back into bondage and oppression. I admire George Washington as much for what he did not do as for what he did in this circumstance. He had the loyalty of both the American people and the military. Had he been a power-hungry man, he surely would have taken advantage of this. He would not have been the first general to take control at the height of his career. But he didn't. He had no power aspirations at all. I had rather be on my farm, he said, than be emperor of the world. He didn't, as he put it, fight George III to become George I. He was the only president to be unanimously voted into office. And again, he wasn't trying to get the position. He'd really hoped to completely retire from public life. But the call came, and he meekly answered it. The sun had barely risen when George awoke. He stood, glancing toward the window before going to dress. Shortly thereafter, he approached the mirror, eyeing his powdered hair and broadcloth suit. He wore it purposely, hoping it might help advertise for the infant American textile business where he'd purchased it. He'd requested breakfast in his quarters, but as he glanced at it, his stomach twisted in knots, and he wondered if he'd be able to eat it. Just after noon, the sound of horses' hooves, the stomp of the troops, and the grind of carriage wheels came to his attention. It was time. He knew it was the Joint Committee of Congress come to escort him to Federal Hall. As they rode down the street, George reflected on how he'd come to be there. All of the battles, the frigid nights, the fear, the anxiety, and the pain. He had never felt adequate, and here he was, again being called to a task so dreadfully overwhelming. He knew again this was going to test his reliance on God. Throngs had gathered to watch the inauguration, And as George stepped onto the portico where the oath of office would be issued, he bowed to the crowd, his expression grave. They erupted in cheers, continuing until George bowed again, placing a hand over his heart. This was a glorious day for America, difficult as it was for him. When the people finally quieted, Samuel Otis, Secretary of the United States Senate, presented an ornate, leather-bound Bible resting on a plush red cushion. He stood between George and James Livingston, who would be administering the oath. As Livingston spoke, George placed his right hand on the Bible, repeating back the oath, solemnly swearing to faithfully execute his office and to defend the Constitution. When he finished the last phrase, George leaned down and kissed the Bible, adding unprompted and full of emotion, So help me God. It is done, James said. Long live George Washington! President of the United States, he declared. The crowd erupted in cries of joy and enthusiasm, adding their own cries of, Long live George Washington, President of the United States. 
and another voice rang out above the clamor. God bless our president. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, said of George Washington, General Washington seems to be one of those illustrious heroes whom Providence raises up once in three or four hundred years to save a nation from ruin. There is not a king in Europe that would not look like a valet de chambre by his side, which basically means a manservant. And fellow signer and author of our first American hymn book, Francis Hopkinson, stated, To him, the title of excellency is applied with particular propriety. He is the best and greatest man the world ever knew. He retreats like a general and attacks like a hero. Had he lived in the days of idolatry, he had been worshipped as a god. George Washington was a great man. But that's because of his faith in the person who truly was the greatest man the world ever knew. That is, Jesus Christ. To deny Washington's faith is to deny history. I started this podcast honestly not knowing to what degree our society has fallen from the truth. And I'm only now beginning to understand how appropriate the name is I chose for this podcast. It might seem like a strange choice for a history podcast. Most people probably would have advised me against it in the marketing department. But to me, it really encompasses the purpose of this podcast. Leopold Schaefer said, Truth is fire, and to speak the truth means to shine and to burn. Or I've heard it put this way, Truth is the flame that sets the heart ablaze. I hope that many hearts will be set ablaze with the truth, and that it won't remain with them but will continue to spread so others can keep alive that little spark of celestial fire within them. Because it is the truth that sets us free, and it is the truth that ignites our faith.